get it right eventually. Now, <laughs> that's better. Welcome, Welcome back to the final session of the conference. And um, a reminder that after the Azure presentation at 3.15, we will be drawing uh, the draw for the Spinifex uh, beer, for the Esky and the beer. And you kind of need to be here in the room for that, uh, because we don't want to go chasing you all over the, the state if you happen to be the winner. So please be in the room for the, just after the Azure Minerals presentation. In fact, be here for the presentation as well. And you, Jackson Crab, will be drawing the name of the uh, the winner. Okay. So our first presentation, Tesoro Resources, is advancing the exciting El Zorro Gold Project, located in the At the Atacama region of Chile. To tell the Tesoro story, we welcome Managing Director Jeff Jeff Reeves. Please make him welcome, Zeph Reeves. No, it wasn't, it was Zef. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, taking the time to come and um, hear the Tesoro story. Um, for some people it's probably familiar, for a lot of people it won't be, but uh, we certainly think we've got a, our hands on a, a very exciting and new gold project in Chile, which we're advancing very rapidly uh, through exploration, um, resource definition uh, towards mining. And uh, we're in the midst of a 60,000 meter diamond drill program at the moment, expanding the El Zorro Gold Project, which is starting to demonstrate some serious scale. This is a simple, straightforward gold project located in the Atacama region of Chile. Uh, so currently we've got 661,000 ounce gold resource. Um, we've done some met work. We've had up to 98% recovery out of that met work. Uh, and probably importantly, that network is indicating that this material can recover high recoveries of gold up to 94% of very coarse grind sizes. I'll talk a little bit more on that. And that has a material impact on future economics of this project and certainly lends itself to straightforward, well known technology, conventional um, processing with a simple flow sheet. Uh, it's located in a world-class location, uh, coastal locations, well supported by infrastructure. Um, there's a port nearby, one hour zip flight north of um, Santiago, very easy to get to. Um, and Chile itself is a world-class mining jurisdiction. Uh, it's the world's largest copper producer. Uh, and you can get things done in Chile very easily. And it's had a uh, long history of mining and a very transparent mining uh, framework. and, and um, a pretty straightforward process to get things up and running and permitted um, into production. Uh, the project, the, the deposit itself, Tanara, has got uh, surface gold, so it's outcropping all body. We've drilled it over 400 metres depth, so it's got open pit and underground potential. Um, and this is a very new style of mineralisation for Chile. Uh, it's a intrusive related gold system. So these haven't been described in Chile before, but it's certainly given us first mover advantage in this new uh, gold district. And we started off with a small concession holding of 1500 hectares. We now own 555 square kilometers and covering over 60 kilometers of what we think is prospective strike for this style. Um, and it's <coughs> well supported. We have a workforce of um, around 60 people on site at the moment operating our drilling programs and a very mature skill mining set, um, mining skill set is available in Chile, everything from open pit mining, assay labs and all the rest of it. So a uh, very good place for us to do business. Uh, so investment highlights for Tesoro, we've only been listed since February uh, 2020. So in that time, we've defined a maiden resource, 661,000 ounces. So this is a new discovery. Um, you can see where we're located there. Um, so this is approximately 800 kilometres north of the capital of Chile, which is Santiago. Uh, one hour plane flight um, to the Copiapo Airport, which is just here. And from that airport up 
to the project is one hour's drive. So really easy to get there. You can get, go and do a site visit in a day from the city very easily. Uh, the regional city is Pop, is Poppy Po here. So that's around 150,000 people. It's like a big Kalgoorlie. It's got all your assay labs, drilling contractors, uh, mining contractors and the like. But this region is really well known for uh, IACG copper gold deposits. So Candelaria is a world-class IACG. Cerro Negro is an IACG related iron deposit and Manto Verde. But we sit well west of that trend and in what we are now defining as the El Zorro gold trend. Um, so we started off with a little ground holding in the middle, which is where that diamond is. That's the Tenera deposit. We've now got about 60 k's of strike, which we're yet to really get stuck into regionally, but we've, we've identified the geology and the rocks, and we think there's more of what we're defining at Tenera to come. Um, our team result, they say in Caldera, so that's 57 kilometres, that's an operating port straight up the Pan American Highway into the project. Um, we're doing all our met work with seawater, so we're anticipating to use seawater for, for processing. So we've got water, we've got power nearby, that power there's got capacity to supply mine. They've already given us some costings on power pricing, you know, it's got a 15 to 17 cents per kilowatt hour, so that's substantially cheaper than uh, now for an equivalent type project here in Western Australia. So this really is a world-class place to, to build a gold mine. Um, the discovery itself, uh, so Tenera sits as this ridge line sticking out of the ground here. So we really have no pre-strip when it comes to mining. This is an outcropping ore body uh, and it dips back to the west um, underneath Tenera East, which is a recent discovery, and that's up in the hanging wall of the main deposit, which has got a material impact to future economics of this. Um, and when we first got to site, the only known gold mineralisation was some artisanal workings here at Tenera, and we've since found the host rocks at Tenera East up to Toro Black and continuing some kilometres north now and over at Drone Hill. All of those have got surface mineralisation um, that we've sampled and drilled, um, and a high-grade vein system in uh, a large intrusion at Torre Gordo. So the more work we're doing to this, the more gold we're finding. Um, it's just a matter of getting through the work, and the real focus has been at Tenera to define that resource, and now we're rapidly expanding that resource. So really, we're at a point now where it's the, the main focus for us is the critical mass on that resource size to warrant moving this through in the feasibility study. Um, we've done, as I said, we've done some met work. So we've had up to 42% um, gravity recovery and 94% total recovery at a 200 micron grind size. So to put that in context, most of the gold deposits in the eastern gold fields would be grinding down to 70, micron to get recoveries like this. Um, our MET consultant tells us that's about as far as we can go before we have issues with it settling in the in cyanide tanks. So, um, you know, what, what it does tell us is this is good free milling material and it does make a material difference to um, cutoff grades and things like that. We can really pull the cutoff grade down and recover pretty much everything that has got gold in it. And that logistical advantage with those low power costs and location, um, uh, key benefits of this project. Uh, so this is a section through the deposit. Um, it's got a number of different pit shells on it at various gold prices and the equivalent reported ounces within those shells. And as you can see, it's relatively insensitive, this initial maiden resource. So in mind, this is back in July, this resource was calculated and it was done off 145 drill holes. We've now collared last night, I think they sent through the 260th drill hole. So a lot of data to put into the new resource model early next year. But what it's telling us is there's a lot of shallow mineralisation here um, that we get to pull out relatively early on in a, in a potential open pit mining scenario. And a lot of these drill results are, are big, wide, thick intercepts with higher grade portions in them. And that's these high grade zones. And we're seeing those get really well developed with the more drilling that we do. So I've been a bit of a focus for the team to um, delineate more of that higher grade material. And we're certainly starting to see all that hang together quite well. We expect a, 
a, a bit of a kick in the grade in the uh, updated resource, which will come out next year. Um, this highlights some of that work that we've done. So this is the $1,800 an ounce pitch shell uh, wrapped around that initial resource. And these are all the drill heads that have been higher than one gram per tonne uh, that we've completed outside of that since um, announcing that resource. And also some scale bars there, just to give you an idea of how big this is. So this is looking north. So this is over 700 metres wide, multiple high grade zones within that pit shell. Picked up a whole bunch of shallow mineralisation out here to the west, which isn't included in that maiden resource. Seeing some good high grade um, zones in, being starting to be quite well developed in the deeper parts of the deposit and the new Tenera East uh, discovery out in the hanging wall, which is we think is going to have a material impact on the uh, economics of the of mining because it's going to help us reduce that stripping ratio. Some drill results over there on the left. This is pretty typical of what we get. Big broad lower grade intercept like 205 metres at 0.96, for example. We get into our high grade zones, 21 metres at 5.26. So they're pretty repetitive. The team knows how to target them now, and we're hitting those regularly, and they're just expanding along strike and at depth. And actually, look, it's looking as though these high grade zones are getting better with depth. So it's starting to look like you know there's potential to take this underground after a pit's finished. Uh, so on the broader um, regional scale or district scale. <clears throat> um, that's our concessions there, the red concessions. Um, we've defined this as an intrusive related gold system. So it's very analogous to uh, the Tintina province in North America. So Northern Star operate the Pogo mine there and there's a large low grade open pit deposit there called Fort Knox. We're probably somewhere in between those two styles, but the rocks are the same age, same composition. Uh, very similar styles of mineralisation. And these haven't been described in Chile before. We're the first um, discovery of an intrusive related gold system in Chile, and that's at Tenera, and we've identified the host rocks over a 60 kilometre um, area of strike, and we're just starting to kick off some of that more regional work now. Um, so we own 555 square kilometres of permits, um, we've, and we've barely scratched the surface. We've only explored, say, 2% of our total concession holdings through this district. Um, we've got multiple targets. So we've just finished some drilling at Drone Hill and Toro Blanco, where we see our host rocks at surface and they're mineralised. We're waiting for assays for those still. And we've had recently the new discovery at Tenera East. So the map on the right here is Tenera itself, which is where we have our resource. And those drill colours are um, coloured to gram metre intercepts. So we've now drilled 20 holes that have had over 100 gram metre intercepts. So it's very consistent um, and repetitive. And we're starting to see these higher grade areas become quite continuous over a long distance. So it's giving us confidence that this has got a lot of growth in it. We really don't know how big it's going to be. We haven't found the edges of it yet. It hasn't got a hard geological boundary. The more drilling we do, the more gold we're finding, the larger this deposit is getting. <clears throat> uh, just a, a quick couple of snaps. That's our team of uh, geologists and fieldies and technical people, but that gives you a good idea of what the the ground looks like. It's the Atacama Desert, driest place in the world. It all sits on government crown lands. We don't have any landowners to deal with. Um, all the rocks stick out of the ground so the geos can see what is really there and we can directly sample the geology. And that's Tenera outcropping, looking back up the hill to Toro Blanco to all the tracks and uh, drill pads and so on that we've put in since we've been there. Uh, so, on Tenera East, this pale colour underneath is our um, block model um, from the maiden resource of blocks greater than half a gram um, outline. And we've picked up these new ore zones out in the east. And so, again, looking at that scale, that's 100 metre scale bar. So, this is a big scale deposit. Um, lends itself to open pit mining out, probably its surface. And if we can start to pick up more ore out here, that's going to fit inside that pit and help reduce our stripping ratio. So 
team's pretty focused at the moment in delineating that. We've now defined that over about 600 metres of strike out there, and it's starting to look quite good. Um, just quickly on the regional stuff, this is a satellite image showing um, some alteration in this red colour um, through a NASA satellite image. Daenerys sits down at the southern edge of this. We think that that alteration is caused by the host intrusive rocks, which host the majority of the gold at Tenera, and that's a 20 kilometre zone there. And our geos have done a little bit of prospecting along there, seeing all the right signs and signals. So we're doing some target definition type work on that and hope to generate some uh, new drill targets to be drilled next year along that zone. Um, and again, geophysics has helped us, but because we've got so much geology sticking out of the ground, once we couple it up with the geology, it, it really does um, produce some very compelling targets, which we've used to good success. Uh, so coming up, um, we're currently in the midst of a 50,000 metre drill campaign. We've so far drilled 80,000 metres of diamond core into this deposit, looking to expand it and get that resource update up out by the end of Q1 next year. Um, I expect that will be a substantial increase to what we already have um, based on the fact that we've probably doubled the strike length, um, certainly seeing that good continuity at depth and we're certainly finding a whole new zone of mineralisation out in the west part of the deposit. Uh, that resource will feed directly into a scoping study, so we'll really start to demonstrate the economics of building a mine here. And we'd like to be moving this through into feasibility as quickly as possible next year. Um, we're doing a lot of that sort of work in the background already, which includes a lot of our permitting work. So it's a fairly straightforward um, process to get something permitted in Chile, but it does take time. So we're running those processes in parallel. But really the key for us is resource size at, at this stage. And uh, we think we're well and truly on the way to doing that. So I um, expected quite a busy uh, period between now and mid next year. So that's the Tesoro story very quickly. So welcome anybody to come and have a chat at uh, Booth 62. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Zeph. Uh, the winner of the Annex Bet Metals Bottle of Whiskey is Rob Healy from Argonaut. Are you in the room, Rob? If he is, he's being very quiet. That's okay. Uh, okay, uh, next up is uh, Caprice Resources. It's an emerging junior explorer with high-grade gold projects in the Murchison and base metals near Northampton. Andrew Muir, previously managing director of NTM Gold before its takeover by Dacian, joined the company earlier this year following the takeover. Andrew will take you through the progress of the company to date and on plans going forward. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks everyone for sitting in on, uh, and thanks very much for the uh, RIU for putting on the uh, fantastic conference. Um, been some great companies here and we're very happy to be part of it. Um, so yes, Caprice Resources, uh, high grade gold base metal projects, um, uh, relatively early stage through to some quite advanced exploration, a um, lot of upside, um, but significantly undervalued. All right, just trying to get the clicker working. There we go. Uh, usual disclaimer, competent persons. Um, corporately, uh, key things to note, obviously, like most gold juniors, we've, we've tracked sideways uh, for the past few months. Um, that's the nature of the beast. That's, that's the way things are. Um, the other key thing to note, um, we've got a really tight capital structure, less than 70 million shares on issue. Um, which is pretty impressive considering that the company's been listed for, for over three years. Um, and an EV of just under 12 mil. So, uh, as I said, I think we're pretty good value, which of course is every managing director's job to say that, but generally I think we are. In terms of board and management, um, good mix of, of grey hair experience, um, corporate and also on ground um, knowledge. Uh, David Church is uh, a lawyer, um, very corporate. Uh, Myself, a uh, geo and finance background, um, likewise Adam Methy and, and Nick Caruso joined the board 
um, just over 12 months ago when we vended in the Island Gold project. And probably the most important person on the page is Chris Orshot, my exploration manager. He's the uh, geological brains behind um, the work that we're doing on, on all our projects. So a snapshot of um, the, the assets that we have, uh, as I said, historical high grades, but they've all had relatively limited exploration. Um, so we've got the Murchison Gold Projects, um, obviously the Murchison region. Um, we've got the high grade um, Island Gold Project. Uh, and we've also got Cutting Warren and Big Bell South that we acquired uh, a couple of months ago. Um, all had relatively minimal exploration um, and uh, strategic location, they're all close to um, two processing plants. And there's Northampton, which is a polymetallic um, base metals play. Uh, historically had a very high grade production, but we think it's been a bit of a sleeper. It hasn't really had any modern um, on-ground exploration for probably about 40 years, but we think it's a really um, good potential for a, an emerging base metals story. So in terms of the Murchison, uh, zooming in a little bit, um, as you can see here, a tier one location, um, you know, over 15 million ounces uh, mined and discovered to date, um, fantastic um, geology structures, et cetera. Um, and the Island Gold Project in the center, um, small scale, but high grade production at the, the turn of last century. Uh, as I touched on before, strategic location where uh, we've got the Great Northern Highway going through um, the Island Gold Project. Uh, it's within 50 kilometres of, of two processing plants, easy access by road, uh, which is Takabiana and uh, Mount Magnet. And we're also pretty close to the uh, Musgrave uh, Lena Breaker Day and also the Musgrave Evolution JV, which wraps around us to the west and to the north. Zooming a little bit further on the Island Gold Project, this is our most advanced project. Um, it's, as I said, it was mined at the turn of last century. Um, with some, some very high grade uh, deposits. Uh, we only acquired it just over a year ago from, it's been in private hands for the past 25 odd years. Uh, it has high grade gold outcropping and banded iron formations. Um, and these were the things that were mined. Um, there's probably about uh, nine or 10 of these um, striking roughly north south. Um, so it's pretty well mineralized. Um, and then there's the lake. So we split the, the Iron Gold project into the island component and Lake Austin. 100% um, of the exploration to date has been on the island. Um, obviously, Lake Austin, it's a salt lake. Um, you know, up until recent times, it's been relatively um, cost prohibitive to explore on it. However, the geology and the structures uh, are still fantastic. So um, it's a high priority for us to, to do the maiden drill program uh, underneath the lake, but we'll, we'll get onto that shortly. So we recently completed uh, the biggest RC program that's been done to date on the island. Uh, we did 83 holes for over 8,000 metres. Um, like everybody in the industry, we're still waiting on assay results. We've only got about 50% of them to date. Um, frustrating, but look, everyone's in the same boat, as we know. Um, the winner out of that was definitely a Vadrian's Hill deposit. Um, one, because we got all the assays back for that rather than, than randomly, but um, 10 metres is 16. Um, including 6 to 26, uh, which was the deepest hole, which is only about 100 metres down vertically, uh, 7 at 3.7, um, and some others there, as you can see, 2 at 9.3 and 7 at 2. So um, we've now got four of these high grade um, positions within the project. We think there's a lot more, um, but again, the, the remaining 50% of the outsides will tell. Um, still, large areas that need to be tested on the island itself. This is a picture of a drone photo from the last drilling program that we did. Uh, we had the two rigs on site that were striking uh, the local NDRC. Um, really good um, snapshot of the difference in terrain between the lake and the island itself. Uh, you can see there's a bit of ridge that they're both targeting. Uh, this is looking um, southeast uh, over Vadrian's North. So Vadrian's Hill, these are the results that I just talked about. Um, there were some low grade hits that were, were close to surface that we followed up. Uh, as you can see, um, 10 metres at 16 was the deepest hole we've done, roughly 100 metres vertical, um, still open down plunge and very much open at depth. It's got a strike of roughly 100 metres, um, but obviously there's, or we'd like to think there's a lot more to come. Um, and that'll be the focus of the next round of RC that we do next year. Uh, Baxter's, this has been around for a little while. You can actually see there's some historic shafts that are on that. Uh, you can see there's been a fair bit of drilling 
up around the shafts, which was largely done by the, the um, private um, owners. They were looking at a small scale toll treatment um, setup, uh, which is obviously not, not something that we're looking at doing. We're looking at growing the, um, the, the asset base and the, the mineralization just to see how big it is. Um, so this is a little bit more advanced. So the 200 meter strike, it's got a northerly plunge. And as you can see, there's some, some high grade shoots within it. And last but definitely not least, there's New Orient. This is at the northernmost end of the, the project. Um, this is more shear related, where the other two were more fold nose related. Um, as you can see, this was again was drilled pretty heavily by um, the private owners, again, looking at a small scale production position, uh, still open at depth, still open at strike. So again, more, more for us to follow up there. Now, apologies for this slide, it's pretty intense, but it's actually um, really quite instructive. So on the left hand side is uh, a release that was put out by Musgrave uh, in October. Um, they've had some fantastic uh, drill results. This is actually part of the Musgrave Evolution joint venture. Um, key thing to note is the, the yellow or orange um, dashed lines there, which are the, the primary controlling structures. So they've got a, a northwest southeast orientation. Sitting above that is um, uh, quite a, a large dispersion halo. Uh, with some super gene enrichment. Now, why that's important is you can see on the right hand side that sits less than a kilometre from our ground. Um, and you can see the orientation of the southwest northeast um, structures there. And we've got those same structures on our ground. So, um, those structures uh, we think are associated with the mineralisation that we've found to date. And more importantly, those structures continue underneath the lake. So, we've got gold on the island, we've got the same structures that. Um, the muscular evolution has got, and they continue underneath the lake. So the obvious drill target is to test underneath the lake. So that's what we're, we're looking at doing um, in the new year. Uh, we were planning to have uh, attract uh, air core rig, um, travel around and do a lot of this drilling, but uh, again, like everyone, uh, drill rigs are in high demand, particularly uh, specialist rigs. Um, so we will be doing uh, using a track mounted rig um, when we can get hold of one. But in the interim, what we're looking at doing is the southern portion, roughly the southern third of the Lake Austin uh, component of, of the Island Gold project is, is actually on land. So we're going to be doing um, some land-based air core, testing those structures, and that'll be cooking off uh, early in the new year. So that's really, really exciting. Um, now, no drill testing into this area whatsoever. Right structures, and we've obviously got gold pretty close by. So um, we're pretty keen to, to get this underway. Um, Cutting Warren, Big Bell South, we picked up about uh, three or four months ago. This is from Golden State Mining. Um, we wanted to expand our land package in this part of the world, give us a little bit more critical mass, um, but not just pick up moose pasture. So we really like the structures and the geology of, of these two projects. They're much earlier stage. They've had a, a few soil sampling and a little bit of air core done on it. Um, Cutting Warren is very close to the Cutting Warren Shear. Uh, fantastic structures and Big Bell South is the interpreted uh, southern extension of, of the Big Bell stratigraphy. So we'll be um, doing some target generation on this and, and working this up in, in due course, but we'll look to have boots on ground um, sometime in the new year. Uh, Northampton, um, as I said, this is well, we think this has probably been a little bit of a sleeper. Um, in the past, uh, you can see the, the green tenements that we've had. They were in the company when, um, when the company listed about three years ago. Um, very high grade historic area. Over hundred of these deposits have been mined. Um, high grade base metals dominated by lead, but also copper and zinc. Uh, a little bit different to most uh, WA based base metals deposits in that they're structurally related. So understanding the structural controls of these things is pretty important. Um, Chris has done, my exploration manager has done some fantastic sort of large scale targeting work. And um, we think that there's good potential to find more of these deposits um, and slightly different style of deposits as well um, related to the structures. Um, the ones that have been mined, all 100 or so deposits, they basically stick out of the ground. As you go further to the east, the regolith or the weathering profile increases. So the likelihood of these actually outcropping is, is much less. So, um, we think there's good potential to find more deposits as we go further east. Plus, we've got a, a slight refinement on the um, mineralizing concept. So, um, we're quite surprised when we saw that all of this ground was free. So, we've just um, applied for these um, 
exploration licenses. So the, um, the red tenements that you can see there are applications which we only put in about two weeks ago. So um, we're pretty pleased to be able to get this massive swathe of land. Um, we've increased our land holding from about 150 square k's to um, about 1100 square k's. So um, whilst the applications will be doing work in the background, um, but pretty rare that you can get this, this um, quality land uh, so close to historic high-grade um, production areas. So that's us in a nutshell. Um, as I said, we're, we're pretty good value, 11 million sort of EV. As you can see, we've got a lot of work going on. We've had the RC programs, so we've got 50% of the results to come back. Um, we'll be doing air core drilling on the lake, which will be the maiden um, program there. We'll be working on cutting wire, Big Bell South. Uh, and of course, Northampton will be doing looking to do geophysics on that and then refining targets um, in due course and look like everybody ongoing assessment of, of new projects. So we think we've got a great sort of risk return ratio. The, the downside from a 11 million EV relative to the success that we could have um, is, is pretty well balanced. So that's a free story. Thank you. Recent ASAS-X listed IPO Mount Malcolm Mines will focus on gold exploration and development opportunities at its Malcolm project within the highly prospective multi-million ounce Leonora Laverton district of WA. Managing Director Trevor Dixon is an entrepreneur with more than 30 years of experience within the mining and exploration sector in WA. Take it away, Trevor. Uh, thanks so much, Derek, and welcome to one and all. Uh, thanks very much to RIU and the opportunity to address you uh, this afternoon and uh, what a wonderful achievement uh, for Stuart and his team uh, here with the 200th uh, uh, conference. So, uh, yeah, uh, enjoy that. Uh, Mount Malcolm uh, recently listed. Um, it comes after many, many, many years in the Leonora district by myself. Uh, having put together uh, such companies as uh, Kin Mining. Now, this is uh, a wonderful opportunity uh, for me to be able to ring the bell at the ASX uh, for the second time in my career. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have been able to do that. And I'm really keen to uh, bring some real good opportunities uh, out of the Leonora area. Uh, our disclaimer. So yeah, um, <clears throat> Mount Malcolm is situated just east of Leonora. Uh, we have put together some 270 odd square k's uh, of land holding there. And importantly, it sits along the Keith Kilkenny liniment, a very important uh, part of the Eastern gold fields. Uh, the Keith Kilkenny has built uh, businesses such as Saracen Minerals uh, recently merging with Northern Star. Saracen was built off the back of the Keith Kilkenny and it's a, a Craton scale structure with uh, mantle tapping uh, fluids working through that system. And there you have a wonderful slide there with uh, the Keith Kilkenny and our holding sitting above it. Above it. We have some 30 kilometres of the Key Kilkenny, uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to getting in amongst that. We've only, only just, just commenced work, work there. We've, we've uh, currently finished a gravity survey, and we'll see that as we walk through the slides this afternoon. What a wonderful amount of targets we have, but um, it's a real, a real challenge to work out which is the best, where should we put the investors' money first? Uh, and that's a challenge for us as a business, but we feel we're up, right up to that challenge. And uh, what a great lot of uh, targets we have there, uh, along with uh, old workings uh, through to soil, same, soil anomalies, and we'll see those as we walk through. Uh, the pipeline of projects, as you can see, they're quite significant. We've, we've currently ranked them as we feel uh, their importance to our business. We're looking to build uh, a resource inventory uh, with these projects and the prospects. 
uh, the Brownfields prospects there at the top of the pyramid and working our way down uh, all the way to the Greenfields projects, sitting along that structural corridor uh, for us. So it's going to give us ample uh, opportunity uh, to have a crack at these and really be able to live, deliver an opportunity for the investing public. This is our uh, flagship here at Calypso. This was first um, brought to the attention of BHP in the early 80s. Um, I believe Jack Halberg brought it to their attention. Uh, whilst these companies had minerals arms during the day and uh, many of those uh, oil related businesses did this, BP Minerals, SO, BHP and the like. Uh, look, they did good work there, some 30 odd diamond drill holes into Calypso. Clearly it didn't meet their criteria, but what we have there is uh, this wonderful big magnetic high. It's really saying to us uh, that there's some magnetism going on there. Uh, iron is a wonderful host for gold mineralization. And uh, we're looking to uh, see what we can do with what we have there. Um, BMGS out of Kalgoorlie brought together uh, an exploration target for Torian Minerals, the former owner, from which we purchased uh, the tenements from. And uh, they, they were saying some 2.9 to 3.9 million tonnes of mineralisation in that range of 1.6 grams per tonne to 2.2. Uh, that equates to, uh, you know, a mineral resource somewhere in the 150,000 ounces to 250,000 ounces. Uh, so we're looking to bring those ounces into the jaw category as a lot of the historic drilling here at Calypso was done in those 80s and that doesn't meet the quality control and quality assurance uh, required of jaw 12 today. So that's, uh, that's our challenge on our flagship project. As you can see, there's some quite good results uh, from higher grades. Uh, the deepest in there, that um, MAD03, so 190 metres to 205 metres. Um, that's a wonderful intercept. Um, that's some of the deepest holes that we have at Calypso. Uh, but of course, um, we've got the other the others, and importantly, uh, you'll see on the next slide that CRC 024 uh, intercepted uh, a series of intercepts from 90 metres through to 97 metres uh, down hole. And uh, why is that important to us? Basically, we, uh, it's important because it sat right on top of target number two right here, so right exactly where our geophysicist, Nordic Geoscience, uh, said that that target two should sit. So this is very recent work, it's gravity. Um, gravity hasn't been used a lot in the minerals game and predominantly it's been used to detect the lighter rocks. Uh, in our case at Calypso, we decided to use gravity on a close space uh, program and you can see that by just the simple amount of dots in amongst that square. Each one of those is a magnetic reading. And that's what's been able to give us this sharp contrast that we can see there. And our geologist, our geophysicist has put together a, sorry. Three D image here that's down to some thousand meters and as you can see these are 500 meter blocks so we have a substantial um dense body uh beneath the existing mineralization here at calypso and that's what we're quite excited about at the moment it's uh we have mineralization sitting above this dense body so uh, that's indicating to us that the banded iron or the iron oxide uh, mineralised rocks sit beneath our current mineralisation and we're very keen to get in amongst, uh, amongst this and drill some uh, deeper holes 
into that. I, uh, for all the M2M shareholders in the room, um, you won't die wondering with us with this particular project um, because we're looking to put a five six hundred metre hole into that dense body and lock, not leave you wondering about what we might have here. And I'll be more than happy uh, if this body comes up with the iron oxide material that we think is there. So uh, this is a really exciting one here in Calypso. We have some other resource targets. Uh, this is the Malcolm Mining Centre. This was historically mined at the turn of the last century. Um, quite a lot of uh, good work was done there, but we have uh, a couple of shear hosted, uh, well, certainly one shear hosted in Dover Castle. Uh, quite a, a large system with some good historic uh, intercepts for us to follow up. Uh, they're 16 metres of 2.3 and 24 metres of uh, 2.4. Uh, they're uh, the types of uh, intercepts you get in these shear hosted systems. And these are shear, zone, shear zones that emanate uh, from that large system that we have in the Keith Kilkenny, that craton scale structure uh, that has a large number of shear zones sitting in and around uh, the system itself. Uh, Dunbarton's is a quartz, uh, quartz vein system there, an historic mine just down in the southern portion here. Uh, some high grades there within that quartz vein. Uh, so we're looking to build some resources, uh, both of these two prospects within the old Malcolm Mining Centre. Now, Golden Crown's uh, another interesting one. Some good in intercepts uh, have come from Golden Crown historically. And uh, yeah, I'm very pleased uh, to, to have announced yesterday, yesterday uh, to the ASX uh, our recent, uh, recent program there of nine holes. We've just uh, brought uh, the assays uh, onto the market and our best intercept being three metres of 11.9. So historic grades there, that announcement is on the ASX platform and you'll see within those four holes a number uh, of intercepts uh, in and around the historic workings. And of course, we've got our namesake uh, at the back here, Mount Malcolm, uh, sitting pretty much central to our entire project area. So uh, yeah, looking for quite a few good things to happen with respect to Golden Crown. Sunday Picnic Shear Zone is a shear zone uh, that I understand well. Um, I've worked uh, this area, taken a lot of gold uh, from the Sunday Picnic Shear Zone, both uh, dewar nuggets and specimen stone from within the shears. This is quite a big system. Uh, some, I've done it again. Some three to four k's long and a couple of k's wide. Uh, this is a, a system of uh, bisqueted shear systems sitting parallel to one another. And each of those systems, uh, as you can see there, a good number of drill holes have given it some testing and we've come back with some good numbers for us to be able to follow up on. Emu egg is a soil anomaly and quite, quite a significant, significant one. one. Uh, you can see mostly their soil sampling. So it's been looked at significantly and it delivers for us some 1300 by 200 meter long soil anomaly. And the odd drill hole into that is demonstrating to us again, another shear hosted system here at Emu Egg. And we're very keen to push along with some exploration on this particular prospect within our group. This is the overall picture. Um, it's a big system, as you can see, this is a magnetic uh, image. The Keith Kilkenny running up here. So a strong system uh, of shearing, but importantly, flip so down here, large magnetic high, and additionally, magnetic highs out through here. Uh, this one's an absolute beauty, uh, absolutely zero testing 
at all on that magnetic signature there just near the um just near the old pit at uh rayside the rayside pits near leonora so um we have the structure and i think we certainly have uh the ability to push this forward uh, we're very proud to have been associated with morgan's morgan's uh stockbroking assisted us to get listed along with stein Steinpag, the lawyers did a wonderful job uh, to get us listed from incorporation uh, through to our listing in September, some nine months. Uh, so we we're very proud to be partnered with those guys. This is a bit of a view of what's coming up for us. And just a quick look at our team here, myself, uh, been in the industry for some 40 years, uh, putting together properties such as this. So, uh, yeah, very proud to be associated uh, with my fellow directors, Robert Downey, an interest, industry lawyer of many, many years, is our chairman, uh, Gary Powell, a seasoned campaigner in the geological field, uh, coming to us after his recent stint at Red 5, and Daniel Tuffin, the youngest member of our group, uh, a, a <clears throat> very accomplished mining engineer, and it's a pleasure to have uh, the group of gentlemen that I'm working with currently here at Mount Malcolm. Quick look at uh, the financials here, uh, M2M's the code. Um, we have some 83 odd million shares on issue, currently only about 45 million of those, so quite tight structure uh, in the marketplace at the moment. So uh, that's the shape of our business. And uh, thank you very much uh, for attending uh, this afternoon. Terrific. <laughs> Just a reminder that uh, you really do need to be here for uh, the Azure Minerals presentation, because just after that, we will be drawing the big prize for the uh, ESCI. So please make sure that you're here. Be, there'll be a full house for Tommy. Kufi Limited has successfully transitioned to iron ore producer this year. The company is looking forward to diversifying into copper by leveraging its experience to develop its Tennant Creek assets in the Northern Territory. Executive Director Mark Hancock will share the company's story and plans to further develop its portfolio while it continues to optimize cash flow from the Waluna Iron Ore District in WA. Welcome, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you, everyone, for your interest. I think uh, Kufi is probably a new name to most of you. It's a new name to us as well because we just changed it last week uh, following our AGM. We've been uh, heavy limited uh, up until that, but uh, with the acquisition of some copper assets, thought, how can we change the name? Well, we'll put some CU in there as well. We've got a pop on the end, but uh, we thought that was going to be a little bit awkward for the receptionist. If you answered the phone that way, people might be offended. So we decided we'd better change the order around and put the CU first. I think the, um, uh, the companies, uh, basically, I'll talk about the projects a little bit uh, later, but I want to start a bit with people um, uh, with access to, uh, to capital markets and deal flow through our chairman, Tony Sage. And then we've got a, a good team of uh, three or four, which I mentioned there, but a uh, bit of a big squad of, uh, of people that can uh, execute mines. And so it's great to have them on board, Jeremy, Eric, Matt, uh, Steve Allen, Ali, a lot of the other guys that we've got on the team. Um, the guys I mentioned there, Matt, Eric, and, uh, and Jeremy, they're all ex uh, Rio guys, um, all had experience uh, with me at Sign, uh, brought a lot of mines into production there. And so we've got people that can, uh, can take things and actually bring them into production. And we've already achieved that, as I'll talk about in a minute, on uh, one of our projects. Um, given that we've been primarily on or focused, uh, it's been a tough sort of four or five months on the share price. We were, uh, I think we were probably up around uh, 12 cents at one stage there. We're back around three at the moment. I think, I think that's, that's probably a bit of a dramatic reaction uh, uh, to the fall in, in iron ore price. So if you back the two together, they basically uh, track each other religiously. But um, yeah, we've got diversity in the uh, in the portfolio. We've got our ore assets that are also uh, got the potential to be able to operate at very low cost. So we think in due course we can uh, we can turn that around. Um, so getting into the uh, to the COP projects first, which as I mentioned, was just acquired last week. So we actually haven't even totally completed the deal. The uh, shareholder approval came through. We're just finalising the, the last couple of documents. Uh, this is basically uh, the key one that we've uh, acquired there is 
is at Town Creek. Uh, obviously, a well-established uh, mineral field been mined for, for many years by, by lots of uh, big name parties. Uh, hasn't sort of had too much attention in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. So with change in commodity prices, a lot of these um, opportunities are, are starting to present quite attractively again. So there has been quite a bit of interest coming into the area in recent times. And uh, yeah, we certainly see some good opportunity for us to uh, um, to be able to take sort of a step by step approach where there's some things that we can get into reasonably quickly and, and not too expensively, uh, bring them to market and then use them to fund uh, further acquisitions or further development opportunities within this portfolio as we go forward. So most of our assets we've acquired in joint venture type structures and saved us paying too much up front to, uh, to get into them. So they've been cheap entry points. Uh, we then bring the operating uh, capability to to those projects moving forward. So the uh, the primary asset that we're talking about here, you can see in that total of the field there, excuse me, there's um, about 6.6 .6 million tonnes at 1.8% uh, copper and about 0.7 uh, grams per tonne gold. So certainly quite significant copper grades there. Um, and as I say, a lot of that we think we can attack through, uh, through smoke and pit cutbacks in the early stages. So the first one that we want to try and uh, focus on is Orlando. Uh, that was last mined, I think, mid '90s uh, by Normandy, um, and it's basically been sitting there since. You can see the pit still in uh, pretty good condition, given that uh, has no one's really been in, in it for 30 odd years. Um, and you can see there also how we're sort of seeing um, stylistically that we can basically do a further cutback to access uh, probably about half or a bit more of the existing uh, or remaining resource uh, by that open pit opportunity. And then in due course, uh, we can potentially push down, uh, reopen some underground uh, workings in the area, which again have, have existed previously, um, to be able to access the remainder of the resource. So that's just one of, uh, of a number of the opportunities there. There's uh, the Gecko area, which has again been a significant uh, mine in its day. Um, and then there were some areas that were we uh, discovered a little uh, more recently, Goanna and Monitor, um, and they were the sort of things that Evolution that owned the project uh, sort of up until 18 months or so ago had seen as having potential for potential significant uh, scale, uh, ultimately didn't meet their criteria. So again, it's been moved on, but for a company like us, we think it gives us a good opportunity. Um, as I say, particularly the open pit, we don't think it's a, a massive exercise to get it up and running. So. Given it's all very new, um, lots of work to be done to, to fully define it, but uh, we have hit the ground running. We've got already a lot of experienced consultants on the job, uh, looking at uh, mine planning work, looking at heritage and approvals, uh, looking at studies, you know, sort of kicking off some, uh, some studies on things like uh, flora and fauna and water and those things that are crucial in approval timelines. Uh, so as we uh, complete those studies in the, in the next, uh, number of months, we'll start to get a bit more definition around timelines and when we can start to expect to be able to, uh, to bring this into production. But as I say, we don't see it as a, as a very long dated exercise. Um, briefly also on copper, we've got a number of uh, joint venture positions in the Briar Basin. Uh, those assets are operated by uh, a variety of different parties, Aurus, uh, Aurus Fund, uh, farmed out a decent chunk of background to Sapphire who are operated there now. So they've been actively exploring in the area. Uh, it's obviously quite close to their drift operations. So they're obviously keen to try and find some additional life there. So these ones are a bit set to get for us really, given that we're not operator of them, but uh, also an interesting strategic asset for us. Um, then in touching on the, uh, the FE business, uh, I guess we've got uh, two key assets uh, there currently. Uh, so I'll just briefly walk you through those. The first is the, uh, the JWD deposit um, out in near Walloona there. Um, as you can see from the map, it's uh, its biggest challenge is its distance from the port, uh, but it's got a very high grade uh, material there and we've, um, we've managed to get that into production uh, quite quickly. Um, again, it's mentioned uh, joint venture type structure, so we own 60% and operate uh, this one. Um, overall, there's a resource on the, uh, the deposit of about 10 million tonnes, a little more at 63.7% uh, FE. And we find that about uh, two thirds of the material at least presents as, as lump material. So those of you familiar with the iron ore market will know that there's a significant premium uh, attached to lump, particularly high grade lump. And uh, that's really the key value proposition for this project, that it's got this high grade lump material, which you can get very few places in, uh, in Australia these days. 
and that's what's really given us the opportunity to bring it to market. Um, it's also an extremely competent material. So I think for our last shipment, our fines in lump ratio was around one and a half percent. So very little degradation of the product. So for the customers who are buying lump, when it gets to whichever market it gets to, they want it to be lump. Um, and this material, that would be, you know, the average would probably be seven or eight percent. This is going about one and a half percent. So they're basically paying for lump and they're getting lump, which is enabling them to, uh, uh, to see a lot of value in the product. Um, we're running it as a pretty small operation, about a uh, sort of million tons, 700, 800,000 tons, a million tons a year. Um, we could ramp it up a little further, but it's not going to be a big scale mine. It's really about trying to maximise the value and uh, maximising the revenue line by uh, by keeping the grade as high as we can. One of the things I mentioned a few of the people before, and they've uh, executed a lot of mines, but again, I think it is a big differentiator for us. So. Um, I, I couldn't think of many mines, if any mines, that have uh, been produced uh, and up and running in four months from uh, from start for $4 million. So um, because it's a, a long way from the coast, we didn't want to spend a heap of money on it. We know iron ore price goes up and down. So we wanted to get it into the market quickly. We wanted to get it into the market cheaply. And that gives us a lot of flexibility in how we manage the project going forward. Um, you can see there basically from uh, sort of virgin, uh, virgin ground in May uh, through to uh, I think it was 1st or 2nd of October, we had our first store on ship. So uh, really quick turnaround. Uh, you can see from the, uh, the August photo there, it's a nice, uh, neat little site. We've got the sort of the pit up, uh, up in the back there and then uh, down to the, uh, uh, to the ROM pad and then the crushing plant and then onto the product plant and basically straight out uh, onto the road. So, um, yeah, as I say, we could bring it together very quickly and cheaply. Uh, we did that by working with our contractors and basically making arrangements with other players in the area, uh, camp sharing agreements, sport sharing agreements, um, office sharing agreements, these sort of things. So we didn't have to build everything from scratch. And uh, yeah, it would have been nice to be in a couple of months earlier than October if we had our iron ore price graph and we were sort of uh, had the first ship uh, a little bit uh, earlier there. Obviously, it would have been nice, but. Um, Anyway, it's, uh, it's still been good for us to get that out. What we did do over this period uh, while we were getting ready is we hedged out our, uh, our first three shipments um, at an average uh, floor price of about $153. So while the iron ore price over that period has probably been you know, averaging a bit over $100, uh, we haven't been subject to that as yet. Uh, so we've done the first two ships uh, and the third hedge one is, uh, is coming up uh, in the next month or so. So um, as I talked about, we've, we've basically tried to set the, uh, the mine up so it's uh, flexible. All of our operating contracts have got uh, short uh, duration, um, short duration termination provisions. Uh, there's very little fixed costs on those contracts, so we can be pretty dynamic in how we, uh, how we run the mine. Um, we're basically uh, continuing to, uh, to crush and haul at, uh, at the moment. Uh, we've got a little bit ahead in terms of our, uh, our mining process, and so we had a little bit too much uh, material on the ROM. So we've slowed the mining down for uh, about six weeks or so to try and catch that back up, preserve our working capital while we're, uh, while we're continuing to crack and truck. And we're just in the process of, of working on a recommencement of the, uh, the mining now so that when this existing product starts to run out in January, we've got uh, material available. And I don't know, I've sort of been selling iron ore for 15 odd years and uh, I don't take a lot of um, heat of the, uh, the consensus view, but I think in general, people are thinking post Beijing Olympics and into uh, the back end of Q1 and into Q2, uh, there's a good chance that there's a significant improvement in iron ore prices. So we wanna make sure that we're continuing to operate um, through this period, uh, preserving our capital uh, as best we can and then being poised to take advantage of any opportunities as they, uh, as they pop up. Um, we've got a, uh, a good offtake arrangement with, uh, with Glencore. They popped in uh, $7.5 million US for us to get us started. And um, originally we had to pay that back over five ships, uh, but because the, uh, the hedging profile has given us uh, some good uh, cash flow, um, we've accelerated that. We've already paid back uh, $5 million over the first uh, two ships. Uh, and we've looked to pay off uh, the rest over the next uh, three or four months. Um, they have. Uh, indicated that we could push that back a little bit. So if we do need a bit of extra working capital, um, there is the flexibility to uh, to reschedule that. 
Um, but yeah, it's definitely been uh, been very good to have their support as we've uh, as we've ramped up, and I think they've done a good job finding some uh, some customer opportunities for us. So we've basically uh, sold uh, one cargo into Vietnam, one cargo into India. Um, I think with our vessel size, which are about sixty thousand parcels out of Geraldton, uh, it works for those countries which typically have smaller receivable ports, um, and so they're happy to pay a little bit of a premium for the product and the freight, whereas a uh, a Chinese customer who can receive a 200,000 ton vessel is probably going to, um, you know, not want to do that. So, yeah, it's opened up some interesting uh, niche markets for us. Uh, as I mentioned, hedging's in place. Uh, probably if we were unhedged, uh, because of the distance, we'd need a sort of a, you know, a plus $100 price, probably around 105 to 120 depending on there's so many variables with these things. People always say, what's the iron price you need to break even? But Freight, currency, lump premiums, you know, fuel costs, all these things have a big variance, but we probably need a triple figure number to uh, to make it work. I think as I jumped on stage, it was about 105 for January, it was trading at the moment. So we're sort of uh, thereabouts. Um, the other one I just want to briefly touch on on the iron ore side is, uh, is Yarram. Uh, it's a project up near the uh, Northern Territory. Um, basically about 110 k's out of Darwin. So uh, whereas we've got a big haul uh, on our existing project, this one's the complete opposite, you know, uh, 100 k haul, um, give us the opportunity to, uh, to run what we think would be a very low cost operation. It's had some historical drilling. You can see a couple of those intercepts there, very exceptional grade, 65% uh, material, 66% uh, material in those couple of intercepts. Uh, and they're basically up in around this area here, which is where we're starting our current uh, drilling campaign. So we've basically got approval for all of these holes in, in yellow. You probably won't see that too well, but the area that's sort of highlighted down in the blue is going to be our priority uh, uh, program to basically do about 15 holes down the, the middle of the ore body, uh, try and test the extent of the, uh, the ore that's been discovered up in this area. Um, this is a granted mining lease. Uh, on freehold land, so we want to try and maximise the uh, the tonnes that we can locate on this area. So as I say, we're just starting on this program now. Um, weather's closing in a little bit, but hopefully we'll get through a decent amount of holes. There was a rig available on site that we could grab pretty quickly. As I talked about, very attractive uh, logistics. Um, Darwin Port, as opposed to Geraldton Port, at the moment we're paying around $22 or so out of Geraldton Port. Uh, the equivalent ship out of Darwin Port would be about uh, $14 at the moment. So not only do you have the massive saving of, uh, of the transport, but the freight cost is significantly cheaper. Bigger ports can, uh, bigger vessels can come in the port and um, also obviously the distance to, uh, to key markets is, uh, is shorter. Uh, so basically we'll complete this uh, Tenant Creek acquisition with the copper, as I mentioned, uh, continue to progress those opportunities uh, to fastly evaluate that uh, that area. Um, JWD with the iron ore, keep it running, keep the cost as low as we can, uh, be ready when the uh, when the price spikes. And uh, Yarram continue to progress the uh, the drilling and the approvals work that's required to uh, to try and bring that into production as another quick and low cost uh, iron ore mine. So yeah, we've got plenty of opening and uh, no, it's, it's been good fun and uh, yeah, hopefully we can come back and give you a further update shortly. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Don't forget, after uh, Tony's uh, presentation, we will be awarding that uh, ESKI. Azure Minerals Limited is an Australian-based exploration and mine development company focused on progressing its portfolio of nickel, copper, and gold projects located here in WA. Tony Rivera is its managing director, and he joins us now with the Azure story. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me the opportunity to present the Azure Mineral story to you. It's almost all about Andover. Andover is a new nickel and copper sulphide project that's operating or is uh, being explored and developed up in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, and it's turning out to be potentially Australia's newest nickel copper sulphide district. This uh, presentation is up on our website, and so for those who are interested, the, these statements can be visited there. Um, operating in the Pilbara is, is very uh, important. It is very important that you uh, recognise the the, the, the traditional custodians of the land up there have a great deal of um, 
recognition of the importance to them of the land in which we operate up there. So we do pay great attention to developing strong and, and uh, ever growing relationships with the local people up there. And it's very important that we continue to keep doing that. And as an extension of the community engagement that we're doing with the uh, local traditional owners, we're also expanding that out in our ESG pro, um, policies to take into effect, into account the, the environmental side of things, the social license to operate, for us to be able to operate in that part of the world, not just with the traditional owners, but also with the other members of the communities who reside in that area. And also obviously the governance side of things is very important as well. Corporately, this is a quick snapshot of, of Azure Minerals. We've got about 310 million shares on issue, trading today at about, uh, or yesterday at about 35 cents, so a market cap of about $108 million at the moment. Major shareholders are shown there. The two biggest ones are a German investment fund called Deutsche Balaton. And the second largest one is Mark Creasy and his group. And, and, and Mark Creasy is a very well-known uh, prospector and, and a very, very successful entrepreneur in the mining business. Um, we've also got a number of other uh, reasonably large shareholders there that can be seen on the screen who have come on recently, which is showing a great deal of support in, in our and interest in our new nickel project. So to the Andover project. So Andover is a nickel and copper sulphide project located in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. It's a project that we acquired about 12 months ago uh, from Mark Creasy. We have a 60% ownership, it's a joint venture. We own our 60%, it's not an earning joint venture. It's we actually bought that 60% from Mark Creasy and his 40% is free carried through to the decision to mine. And some of the names of the deposits and, and mines up there that you can see at the bottom of the screen, are those are the ones that he, either Mark has personally discovered or ones where he has owned the, those projects and then other companies have come in and made those discoveries on his property. So a yeah, very, very well-known, very successful mining entrepreneur. And having him with us on this project has is, is been fantastic. So shows there on the, showing there on the map on the northwest corner of Western Australia. Um, that is where the Andover project is located. And also shown on there is some, some of the drill core that we drilled um, about 12 months ago in one of the very early holes. So we're, we're hitting very nice high-grade nickel and copper sulphide mineralisation in the drill core. So Andover and Azure Minerals actually go very well together. We have developed a, a great team, we've built a great team and brought together people that have got excellent experience in being able to um, explore, discover, and develop and operate nickel mines. So that's partly my background and also the background of numerous other members of our team have very strong credentials in the nickel space. And of course, nickel and copper are very um, keenly sought after these days. Uh, they are the clean and green energy metals of the future that we've, we've been looking for. So it's very, very good for our company to be operating in that space. The project is, um, we own is about 70 square kilometres. We control most of the, uh, the complex that hosts the nickel mineralisation. And we've got a lot of exploration underway with three drill rigs consistently drilling there throughout this year. Company's in a very strong position, over $24 million in the bank at the start of this current quarter. So this is a, a, an image showing the geology of the area around the Carafa to Roburn area. Um, our project is shown there, outlined there in blue on the right hand side of the image. So it's a two hour plane flight from Perth to Caratha. You then drive half an hour along the Northwest Coastal Highway, which goes right through the northern part of our project area. And from there, there's a, there's a lot of roads and tracks that go throughout that project area. So access into there is excellent. And then around that area, everything you could possibly need for an exploration or mining project is right there on our doorstep within probably half an hour's drive. So we've got mobile phone coverage throughout the project area. We've got all the services and infrastructure you possibly want to not only progress the exploration program, but also to take it through into the development and the mining stage. So if we zoom in a little bit now, uh, same geological plan, but we're just looking at a, uh, more of the, uh, the area. Once again, outlined in blue is our project area, single exploration license, uh, 70 square kilometres. 
It's a layered, the Andover complex shown there in green is a layered mafic, ultramafic intrusive complex. So in, in that respect, it's very similar to a number of other nickel projects elsewhere in Western Australia. For example, the, uh, the Fraser Range project, the Fraser Range province, which has got the Nova Bollinger mine that IGO are operating um, and Legend with their Mawson discovery, for example. Uh, more recently, Chalice Mines with their Julemar discovery is in, also in a layered mafic, ultramafic intrusion. And then further to our north up in the, uh, in the Kimberley region, you've got Panoramic Savannah project, which is geologically looks very similar to what we have here at Andover. So what we do know about Andover, it is a very fertile, nickel-rich environment. We've been exploring there now for just over a year, and we've already drilled into three separate targets that have hit nickel and copper sulphide mineralisation, which we have called VC7 East, VC7 West, and also VC23. And all three of those targets were drilled, were, that we drilled were based upon electromagnetic surveying. So we've carried out firstly airborne and then surface electromagnetic surveying. We've identified electrical conductive material. We've drilled it and three out of three times we've actually hit nickel and copper sulphide mineralization. So it's, it's a great success rate at this stage. To the point where the VC7 East deposit, the drilling of that one is now complete. We're waiting on final assays for the last few holes, and then we'll be into the mineral resource estimate process, which we expect to be able to develop and uh, or, uh, deliver in the uh, first quarter of next year. And the drill rigs have moved on from VC7 East. They are now drilling on VC7 West um, prospect. We've got another one called Skyline, where we've had a drill rig in there recently drilling as well. And there's a number of other targets you can see. So what's shown there in those pink dots are the ones where we've already drilled, those targets we've drilled and we've hit nickel on them. The white dots you can see on the map there, those are the ones which were identified as really good looking high priority targets, which will be drilled in the near future. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of opportunity in this project for, uh, for more discoveries. So if we zoom in a little bit now into the southwest corner of the project area, we're looking here at the VC7 uh, prospect. On the right-hand side, you've got VC7 East deposit. The surface expression of it is shown there as green here, which is where these nickel and copper-rich gossams outcrop. And the actual outline of the deposits as projected to surface is shown there in red. It's about a kilometre, a bit over a kilometre long from east to west, and we've found very strong electrically conducted EM targets all the way along that kilometre long zone. And, and some of them are shown here on the, on the uh, left hand side of the image, which are the VC7 West target. So the eastern side of things, um, we've, we've drilled about a bit over 110 drill holes into that. All up in this area, it's 120 holes for about 56,000 metres. VC7 East deposit is around about 400 metres long from east to west. It extends from surface where those gossams outcrop here, extends and it plunges towards the, uh, the west here, and it uh, goes down to at least 550 metres below surface and it looks like it continues significantly past that as well. Um, what we've seen and we'll see in the next slide, the, the internal continuity of the mineralisation in VC7 East is excellent. Both the continuity of the mineralisation in the vertical sense, but also the continuity between, along the, the length of the deposit and the consistency and the grade distribution throughout the deposit as well. So, and VC7 West, this is the way area over here now. We have now got two drill rigs in here. We're currently drilling in there. There will be some news that's going to be coming out potentially next week on that one. Um, and so far, what we're seeing there are uh, pretty historically. And, uh, and also recently is looking very, very positive. So if we just zoom in a little bit on the, onto VC7 East, and this is four cross sections that we're looking at from the one on the left-hand side, we're looking further to the east as you step to the right. Each of those cross sections is around about 50 metres apart. The mineralisation is shown there in, in red and orange. It, it extends to, op it's open at depth in all of these sections extends up, it is then there is a one single fault that crosses it and steps it up close to the surface on each of those as you go further to the east. And the mineralisation there is the continuity, as the drilling has demonstrated, as you go down the deposit, 
and also the continuity within the deposit of those of that mineralization is is excellent and where you get a high grade drill hit of massive sulfides in one hole and you drill another hole not too far away 40 50 meters away you're going to be hitting mineralization in that one that is very similar so the mineralization overall is a is a mineralized envelope that's around about 15 to 30 meters wide and there's a knife sharp contact between the mineralized zone and the surrounding wall rock, host rock. So we know we're in it or you're out of it. There's no, it's not gradational. And in addition to that, you've got um, within that an internal high grade zone that's between four to eight metres wide, running, grading around two to 3% nickel. And here are some of the drill hole we recently put out over the last couple of months, just shown here. High grade zone, four to six to eight metres wide, running two to 3%, sometimes up near 4%. Overall mineralized envelope 15 to 30 meters wide. And this is a VTM uh, image that shows an airborne electromagnetic survey. The pink and the red zone, whoops, my apologies there. The pink and the red zone. So these are the areas where we've got targets and where we're going to be drilling. The only areas we've drilled so far, two at VC7, here at VC23, both have been successful in hitting nickel. We've got a heap of other targets yet to drill as well. So there's a lot of opportunities there. So full steam ahead on Andover. We've got um, the mineral resource underway for VC7 East. That should be out in the first quarter of next year. West drilling is underway. We hope to prove up a second deposit there. Exploration drilling is also underway on all those other targets. So there's a consistent news flow coming. And in addition to that, we're also carrying out development studies. So evaluation and assessment of a, a development and mining operation is underway. And so metallurgically, this is looking really positive. All the other studies are all underway. And so far, we're seeing nothing in the way of uh, a red flag or anything that would indicate that the project uh, has any negative aspects to it. And just very quickly, we like to, uh, to cover a, a couple of different metals. Um, when we acquired the nickel project from Mark Creasy, we also went and bought a project in the Leonora district. Uh, it's a gold project. We own it 100%. It's called Barton located in the eastern gold fields of Western Australia. We control either granted tenements or applications, a bit over 640 square kilometres of land. You have Leonora up here. Um, Trevor Dixon a little earlier today, this afternoon was talking about his land, which is all up in this area through here. Our grounds are shown there in those tenements. You can see the blue, the pink, the red. Immediately to our West, you have uh, the Genesis Minerals Ulysses project, which has got over one and a half million ounces of gold sitting out there. Immediately to our east, you have satin metals with just under a million ounces of gold. Just to the southwest, there's another a lot of exploration being done by companies like Metallicity and Nex. So there's a lot happening. They've had some good discoveries in there as well. So there's a lot happening in the area, exploration-wise, but there's also a lot happening corporately. So we know that Genesis took over ANC mining earlier this year, and that that's takeover was successfully completed. Metallicity have a takeover bid for next underway at the moment, and some Barbara had a, a crack for the kin mining not so long ago, and, and who knows, they may come back for a second bite of that one as well. So in this district, there's a lot happening. So if we zoom in onto the, uh, the project itself, I can see our main tenement that's being granted sits here in blue, 200 square kilometres. Little bit of drilling in the southwest corner called Daisy Corner. Just south of our boundary, we have the Puzzle North discovery recently made by Genesis. They've been, this is over 600 metres long. They've drilled up very close to our southern boundary. Uh, we've recently completed our heritage surveys in this area and uh, we have our approvals in place and we should be drilling, RC drilling in the Daisy Corner within the next week or so. So there's a lot of activity happening here as well. And so it's going to be, and not only will we be drilling in this area with RC, but we'll also be drilling air core drilling next year on some of these other targets that we've identified. So as far as the company goes, we're in a really strong position. We are well cashed up at the moment, and we've got two really great projects. We've got a great nickel and copper sulfide project, which is just going absolutely gangbusters at the moment. And we've got a, a very, very interesting and exciting gold project at Barton. <clears throat> We've ticked those boxes in terms of the right sort of commodities to be getting into. And it's just full steam ahead. We have, with that cash backing that we've got, we're able to do a lot of activities. We've got a lot of news flow coming. 
not only this year, but all the way through into next year as well. So I think it's a matter of watch this space. There's going to be a, a lot of really good news coming through for Azure. And on the back of that, I say thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. And now we've come to the moment you've been waiting for, the draw for that uh, fantastic 35-litre Yeti Esky filled with selected Spinifex brewing beers. It's uh, brought to you by Coop ASX Brand Management. They're sponsoring the door prize. Uh, Coop is an innovative marketing company specializing in the ASX. It's headed by a brand director, Lachlan Horn. So joining us is, is Jackson Crabb, who's going to talk us through this, uh, this prize. So... Um, try... How are we going? Oh, right. Thanks, John. First of all, yes, I'm not lucky. I'm Jackson. Um, before I go with the draw of the Yeti Esky, which comes with the Spinifex beers, uh, I just want to make a special mention to everyone who's here, but in particular Stewie on his 200 conference. I've been very fortunate to work with Stewie since July 2012. So this February will be my 10th RIU Explorers conference. And it's funny, you know, when I first started working for Stewie at the 2013 Explorers Conference, it was 60 odd booths, about 700 registered delegates. Well, what have we got here today at this conference? We've got 62 booths and we've got just over 700 registered delegates. So it's amazing to see how once you get a conference up and going with the tremendous support of the great sponsors and delegates and presenting companies, how quickly these conferences can evolve into a must attend because 10 years ago, as I mentioned, Explorers was 700 delegates and now it's 1,600 delegates. So. And Jackson, uh, it was great last night uh, over drinks to watch that video which uh, uh, showed the, the transition from the beginning right through to where we are today. Absolutely. So it's been a tremendous effort by Stewie and, and well done to him. So it's great to see so many people here, but I'm sure that you're all desperate to find out who is the fortunate person to walk away with the Esky. So Lockie sent me a message with three different names. So first of all, I'll read out his first and let's hope that person is in the audience. And as Jerry mentioned, Coop uh, are involved in brand management. You may have seen our conference, the Southwest Connect. Well, we got lucky to do all the branding for that conference and look out for a new company that could list on the ASX in February, March next year called TG Metals. It's one to look out for because he did the branding for that company as well. But the winner due to his random generator of technology Shane Volk from Dundas. <laughs> Shane here. Oh, yes, you would. <laughs> I'll let Lockie know you just listed on the ASX, so you won't need any branding. So that's good work for Lockie. So well done, Shane. Yeah. Thanks. And I think we've got, I'm pretty sure, we've got three great presentations to finish the day. So it'd be awesome if you could all stay here. We've got Hot Chili on Next, Nexus and then stably. So all three companies exploring for different commodities in different areas of the world. So definitely three stories that are worth hanging out for the next 45 minutes to listen to. Thank you, Jackson. Now, if you're interested in copper mining stocks, Hot Chili merits attention, a leading copper developer on the ASX and OTCQB. The company aims to be one of the top copper mines in Chile aiming to consolidate copper projects to form a major copper mining hub in Region 3 on the Chilean Coast Range. The centrepiece of the Chilean copper mining portfolio is Cortadera, and the company believes it may be one of the most significant copper gold discoveries of the past decade in Chile. To tell us more, we're joined by Managing Director Christian Easterday. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, and uh, congratulations to Stewie for his 200 conferences. Uh, certainly been one, one of the uh, stalwarts of the industry in my time. Anyhow, today we're, uh, we're going to uh, just go through a bit of an update on all things hot chili. Um, it's been a very exciting time for the company this year. Uh, we've really, really transitioned uh, the company um, on a footing to compete with the largest copper developments uh, in the world. And, uh, and that's that's uh, that's seen some some really uh, really interesting developments um, for the company and for, uh, for for what we're trying to do and what we've been doing for over a decade. 
since we went over to Chile to establish ourselves on the coastline. So we'll just talk about the space that we're in. It's, a, it's a really one of the leading spaces. It, it is now the second most valuable metal um, in the business overtaking gold this year, um, travelling at uh, a very strong prices, above $4. So we are definitely in a new copper cycle at the beginning one, and, uh, and timing is everything in this business and, and positioning your project um, with scale, with level of advancement. Um, to transition into production is one of the key things that you need to be able to guide um, when you're moving in a space that, uh, that is a multi-billion dollar space and that is um, mostly funded by the North American market. So uh, as, uh, as Australia's really uh, leading copper developer, we now have 2.9 million tonnes of contained copper, 2.7 million ounces of gold, uh, in open pitable resources on the coastline of Chile, north of Santiago. Uh, about three months ago, we completed a $40 million capital raising, and that was to take out uh, the acquisition of Cordadera. And this presentation is going to focus on Cordadera. It's, uh, it's obviously one of the most significant porphyry discoveries made in the past decade, um, one of the very few major, porf major copper discoveries uh, to enter the pipeline, and it's really transformed hot chili into this position. Uh, that capital raising that we took out um, to, to, uh, to buy the asset 100% also saw Glencore, the th third largest mining company in the world, take a 10% position in the company and, and give us a very strong endorsement. Right at this point in time, we're, uh, we're a little quiet over at hot chili. We're in a, in a bit of a blackout period while we finalise a prospectus and IPO for a dual listing into the Canadian market. And that is really about finally, um, you know, the only orphan of the large copper development space um, going home. And home for us is, is where all the rest of our peers are, all of the largest copper developers in the Americas um, currently preside. So what we have here is a, is a concept to develop a major coastal hub, um, putting together two deposits, our original product tour of discovery that we made at the end of the last copper cycle and combining that and bolting that onto to this major discovery in Cordera. What makes it unique is that not only are we sitting in the well within the top 20 projects by scale globally, is that this is one of the lowest altitude major plays um, in the world. And, uh, and what's unique about um, the project outside of its low altitude is also that the fact that it's one of the very few low no arsenic projects that is coming into the pipeline um, and copper concentrate supply with no arsenic is becoming a very rare feature of the industry. We're effectively the coastal version of what Tech and Newmont are building up in the high Andes about 100 kilometres from us. They're joining to together two very large deposits at very similar scale, circa half a percent copper equivalent, but they're doing it between 4,000 metres and 2,300 metres elevation. Um, in comparison, we're looking at connecting our two deposits via a 15 kilometre conveyor, not 40 kilometres, but connecting two big deposits, one at 1,000 metres altitude to another at 800 metres altitude for central processing. We are studying a project that is aiming to put out around 100,000 tonnes of copper production annually, um, studying a 25 to 30 year mine life, dominantly open and pitable, um, and something that will put out around 70 to 80,000 ounces of gold annually. Um, so this is not a small project. Uh, this is a project that's going to be seeing um, annual revenues in excess of a billion US um, for a very long life. And that is what takes uh, a very long commitment and a company such as Hot Chili spending over a decade um, on the coastline putting this together. We have a pre-feasibility which we're aiming to deliver next year and a major resource upgrade um, that will boost the size of Cordadera's maiden resource that we put out a year ago that gave us 724 million tonnes on the coastline. Just a few weeks ago, the transition of Hot Chili continued. Our shareholders uh, approved a 50 to 1 consolidation. We now have a very youthful 87 million shares on issue, uh, trading at uh, just over $2 a share. Um, but more importantly, uh, when we look comparatively at where all of our peers are in North America, trading at a fraction of the valuations that the Canadian and US market 
gives to assets in this size class. Um, companies such as Philo or Solaris or Jose Maria or Orico, all companies that have tripled, quadrupled five times their valuations to sit in a space that values assets like this um, around the 500 to $1.4 billion mark um, at this moment. So that is really what's behind the dual listing as an initial first step uh, to put this product into, uh, into the same time zone as the North American investors. Glencore is our largest shareholder. Management sits at about 8% represented by our long-standing chairman and biggest supporter, Murray Black, and GS Group, Shandong China, are also sitting above 5%. We're about a $180 million company at the moment, and uh, we see that changing um, quite dramatically. Um, so not only are we, uh, are we a bit of an orphan in the crowd in North America and that we're uh, waving the Australian flag, but um, you know, we're very unique because we're holding something that, uh, that makes us unique, and that is Cordadera, one of only two major discoveries reported globally since 2014. Uh, the other one was Rio Tinto, and um, with four times the amount of drilling, uh, they were able to announce their uh, first resource on we knew up in the Patterson here in Western Australia last year in September. A month later, Cordadera's resource was put out in the market um, matching it size to size and beating it on grade. Um, so this is certainly very, something very significant that's just occurred and has uh, has been able to um, thrust hot chili into this position. So what we have now is, as I've said, two assets that uh, sit very close to each other. Ten years of investment to put together infrastructure corridors, surface rights. Um, in December of last year, we secured a maritime concession for all of our water requirements on the coastline. So um, literally permitting that takes seven or eight years um, to secure. That's what we're leveraging off of. That is what Cordadera is bolting onto. And that what is what makes this project in the large scale copper development pipeline uh, one of the earliest projects in the line for, um, for first production. And we're aiming to deliver our pre-feasibility next year, our definitive feasibility in late 24 and have this um, in production in 2026. And, uh, and all of that is really um, a lot to do with the hard work and grit that the Hot Chili team has put in over a decade into this area. So we've consolidated a very large land holding and have all of the key infrastructure um, easements and permits in place to build this mine. So where we are in the larger scale projects, um, we're part of the red bars that you can see there, that they're the ASX players. So yeah, again, um, most of those bars are blue. Uh, they are the TSX, TSXV companies. Um, these are the largest projects in the world that majors don't control um, and, uh, and not very well, well represented in the Australian space. So to, to be catapulted um, well within the rankings of the upper tier two assets and pushing ourselves towards a tier one status next year, um, to have one of the fourth best grade deposits in this scale class um, is also something unique. Um, but layering across altitude, um, this is not a high end EM project at 4,000 metres, um, projects that cost a lot of money, um, both in capital and operating cost, um, is something that, um, that makes this unique. And as, as I've mentioned, the quality of the concentrate that will come out of this. So I've said this time and time again, it's very rare to get assets that are you know, in Australia, Chile, um, or Canada um, in this class range, tier one assets. Um, and it's, it's very unique to have big copper projects sitting um, at less than a thousand metres next to a port um, and on the Pan American Highway. So I guess those are really some of the key features which, uh, which give a lot of competitive advantage to what we're doing. We've uh, continued to drill this deposit since we started drilling in 2019 when we took on the acquisition. Uh, the drilling really hasn't stopped. We put another 45,000 metres of drilling in this year since we put that maiden resource out. And that is, uh, I guess, shaping towards a, another significant resource upgrade. Um, the project has consistently put out some of the best results in the industry. Um, some nine of the top 30 drill results in the copper space since the beginning of 18 have been uh, out of Cordadera. 1,000 metre intercepts, typically 0.4, 0.5% copper with 0.1 to 0.2 grams per tonne gold, but all of them having extremely wide, uh, higher grade intervals. So out of the Rockstar team that Hot Chili is putting together, um, 
you know, a very talented new management group um, being led by Dr. Steve Darwin, who also leads Solgold's technical team on the drill out of the, 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 the uh, probably the most significant um, copper discovery of the past decade in Solgold's Kazkabal. Um, Steve is leading Hot Chili's team and employing very similar techniques to how we grow and expand this deposit. The deposit comprises three porphyries, um, but primarily the difference with um, an asset like Kazkabal is that um, these are all large open pits that you're looking at. They extend through the surface and feature quite a bit of high grade um, optionality between the two large open pits now. This is looking side on at Cordadera over the 2.3 kilometre discovery zone, which we have not stepped out of yet. It features plus one kilometre vertical ore columns. These are type two porphyries. I mean, the porphyry um, dictionary, that means that, uh, that they're soft in the middle, um, that, uh, that you're not just looking at the open pit potential, you're looking at cave ability potential on these things. Um, vertical ore columns that are soft in the middle cave easily and tend to lend themselves to higher resource to reserve conversion. So certainly a high grade core that was discovered by Hot Chili has continued to expand. We've continued to try and close out the ore body, um, which with uh, several flanks still left open. Um, and we've focused on lifting the inferred into indicated because we have a large pre-feasibility underway and we're looking to maximize that mine life um, in our next step next year. These are just some of the drill results um, coming in on this porphyry. Look, they've been fabulous. Um, more 800 metre intercepts, more 600 metre intercepts. These are continuous long ore columns and they lend themselves to bulk mining. And uh, certainly the strip ratios that we're going to see out of Cordadera are going to materially impact the entire Costa Fuego's open pit strip ratio. Um, very important when you're talking about low, low cost production base. But when we sit this uh, next to Solgold Dal Pala deposit, a deposit that really started at about 600 metres below surface, featuring a very large high grade core um, that is really the centrepiece of BHP and Newcrest's interest in that project and their circa 13, 14% shareholdings. I guess this is uh, something that, uh, that another major saw um, in Glencore was, uh, was all of the ingredients to um, be sitting on a tier one camp that hasn't been exposed as yet. So a lot of high grade coming out of the core um, for very similar reasons at very similar depths and certainly giving us the potential to have a 25 to 30 year long life open pit supported by a high grade underground cave operation, probably scheduling in at around about year 10 or year 12. The next steps are really what Hot Chili is really excited about. Uh, this is uh, the moment where, where a company that has been exploring in this area for nearly a decade um, and got very lucky at the beginning um, of the company's life in 2010, we discovered Product Tora within three months of listing the company on the ASX. It was a very big drill out. Um, and we fast forward to Cordadera that you can see in the background just across the valley. Um, signing a deal, commencing drilling and, and, and not stopping on a resource development drill out that we clearly have some large land holdings that we've done a lot of specialised work on for a long time. Some of that work is more recent, employing Fathom technology, 3D geochemical modelling, new to the industry. Um, this stuff is behind some of the really significant discoveries by Solaris more recently in Ecuador with the Ritz at East 1200 metre intersection. Um, so this technology that we've put across our surface geochemistry has been rolled across our projects. Um, it gives you the ability to um, find and model three-dimensional probability models for where you would find porphyries. So proof of concept was, uh, was always something we looked for first. Could it find our deposits and, uh, and you bet it found all of them. It found all of the three porphyries and modeled nearly identical three-dimensional probability models um, that almost mimicked our resource shapes. So um, having a number of these big targets located, one of them right next to Product Tora where we had a big drill out, um, sitting right where we we're going to put a ROM pad for the, for the mine. Um, these next series of 12 large scale targets are the next six month drill focus for Hot Chili. This is where Hot Chili says, you know, do we have another one? And we employ over a decade of exploration that we put into these targets and started to tighten up. So 
permitting in place, drilling commencing on Productora Central, and then moving on to other targets. Um, but, uh, but that drilling will start before Christmas. And it'll move on to some very large footprints, north and south of Cordadera and things that we'll be talking about in news flow to come over the coming months. So really the next steps for this company are all around firstly positioning hot chili in, in and amongst our um, large scale copper development peers in the next days, um, certainly next week, um, a lot of growth drilling, a lot more drilling results coming out of our um, finalization, of our uh, resource upgrade program, um, major resource upgrades next year, one in February, one in the third quarter with the delivered pre-feasibility on this large scale cost of Fuego development. Um, but what this really is, is the opportunity to establish uh, an Australian in a large scale copper space in this cycle. And uh, one of the only juniors to transition from Australia um, into the development space. So um, a very exciting time for Hot Chile. Thank you. Next is Minerals, is a junior gold explorer that has recently announced its Crusader Templar gold discovery within the company's broader Walbrook Gold project in the eastern goldfields of WA. To tell us more, we welcome Managing Director Andy Tudor. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Welcome, everybody, this afternoon. I'm here to discuss and uh, elaborate more on our uh, new discovery at uh, Templar Crusader and um, to give you a bit more of an in, um, insight into recent capital raising that we've undertaken and um, how we're gonna do our best to uh, meaningfully spend the money and uh, do the best we can to upgrade this, this discovery. So Nexus Minerals, roughly 288 million shares on offer and a fairly healthy share price. Um, of recent times, it's um, it's been good to see some exploration success and to see a, uh, a share price has followed it. And I think that's a uh, testament to uh, to the nature of the discovery and uh, and how people are starting to really get their hands and their heads around uh, what we've got and what, uh, what we think this thing could become. Board and management team with uh, 100 plus years of experience of uh, corporate mining and exploration uh, experience and um, certainly been in the space a long time, done it before, and we're happily uh, enjoying the ride to do it all again. I'll be talking today about uh, two of our project areas, uh, the Eastern Goldfields and the Walbrook Gold Project, and a recent uh, Porphyry Copper Project in Victoria that we've picked up that um, we've been sort of looking at over the last three to four years. And um, it's just been very recently that it's sort of come onto the books and um, we're undertaking an original, um, an initial, uh, look at the project and undertaking a, uh, a study there as well. So I'll go through that. But initially it'll be about the, uh, the Eastern Gold Fields project in WA. So the Walbrook Gold project is uh, tucked in and around all of Northern Stars project uh, area at Karasu Dam. Um, area has been mined for the last sort of 20 years by Saracen and now Northern Star. And the tenure and the majority of the tenure that uh, Nexus has pulled together over the last seven or eight years has come from both uh, Northern Star and from Newmont um, ground that we managed to, you know, really bring together a large project area. It was all piecemeal and we've managed to grab that uh, and get over 250 square kilometres of uh, really good gold tenure that we're exploring at the moment. So the Walbrook Gold Project itself, it's roughly 80 kilometres north to south, 10 kilometres east-west. And the amount of work, uh, the majority of work we've been doing has been tucked in between two operating gold regions, being the Porphyry Mining Centre, Walbrook in the centre mine, and Karari and the Karasu Dam region to the south. So before we started hitting the ground, we spent a lot of time down at Karari and underground there looking at the rocks um, we had a good association and relationship as we still do with, uh, with the Northern Star. So it was really a matter of pulling together what are the ingredients that has made that success, such a successful operation and then what we can do to replicate it. So we spent a couple of years pulling together that and doing the initial groundworks. And what we're really starting to find now is that the, the district with its multi-million ounces is really starting to show um, for us, that this complexity that we're managed to get our, our heads around now um, 
the gold deposits are in and around these high level intrusives. And that's what we've been uh, intersecting in uh, drilling recently. So this is a, uh, a long section of this Crusader Templar line and it's roughly 1.6 kilometres. So we initially started talking about Crusader and Templar as, as two separate uh, prospects, but really they, uh, they butt into each other and they were only separate because there simply had been no drilling. So this is an area that's uh, devoid of any surface expression. Uh, there's no historical mining of any description. We're not drilling under, in and around any old pits. And there's been no old timers workings either. So it really is a blind discovery, uh, discovered through a lot of uh, geophysical techniques and a lot of groundwork and perseverance and working up the project. So it's taken a number of years with uh, regional soils as well, Air Corps, initial RC programs, and now we're really starting to see it come together. So now we're comfortably that we're currently seeing this 1.6 kilometre strike and we drilled roughly down to sort of 200 metres at the northern and the southern ends and then we're starting to build the picture through the middle as well. So everywhere we're drilling, we're seeing good, uh, good intersections, good mineralisation and it's the continuity and the scale that we're really starting to get our heads around now and the size of it. So the 30,000 metres is currently underway and that's going to improve our confidence across the 1.6k and down to about 200 metres vertically. And then as we move forward, we'll start to gradually drill deeper and deeper and, and we'll start looking at, um, at some deeper diamond drilling and some more advanced uh, RC drilling as we move forward. We've just undertaken, as I said earlier, a $19 million capital raising, so we've got $24 million in the bank. And a lot of that has been around being able to move this uh, RC drilling and this project as quickly as possible. We're not, um, we're at a phase and a stage now where we're comfortable with selecting drill locations based on visual uh, mineralisation. So we're going to wait for the uh, assay results, which are uh, taking a hell of a long time at the moment. So we're able to plan and drive the exploration program based on a very much a visual um, intersections. So that's going to keep growing as we move forward. And, you know, we talk about the same host rocks and alteration as Karari to the south. And we certainly unashamedly are uh, looking to repeat that and hopefully put it in spades and uh, really make it uh, something that's serious in a scale size. And just by way of scale, um, if we take the Karari gold mine, which is, you know, 5 million ounces and been mined for 20 years and place it at the same scale, you know, we comfortably end up with four of them across the strike. So you end start to get a feeling for uh, the scale here and what we're looking at. So that gives us a, if you like, a strike length um, idea. And the other thing which is really helping us uh, is now we're looking at the, the Azure section before where they had sort of the four cross sections. Uh, this one actually takes 20 cross sections through the whole of the Crusader prospect and actually puts it all onto the one space, onto the one line. So what it shows you there is if you've got mineralisation which is poorly distributed and doesn't really make sense and you sort of doesn't allow you to drill and understand what's going on, you end up with more or less a splattering of colour across the screen. Whereas as you can see there from section to section, no matter where we drill along that 800 metres, we're seeing the same picture. So we're seeing a supergene enrichment in the oxide, which is ideally what you want. And then we're seeing a hanging and a football zone as well. So no matter where we plan, no matter where we drill along that 800 metres, we see the same picture. So this is what's allowing us now to build up this story, build up the picture, and section to section it continues to look good. And I realise a lot of people's eyes glaze over when you show the uh, show more and more rocks, but um, you know the whole picture up here and the whole reason why the mineralisation is where it is is because of the alteration that we see in the rocks. And the top picture there is the picture of the Karari gold mine of Saracens back in 2018. And it shows four distinct types of alteration. So you've had four lots of pulses of mineralisation that's come through and each one that comes through upgrades and increases the amount of gold that's in the system. So if you only have one or two of them, you have lower grades. If you have three in the four phases, well, then you end up with the highest grades. And what we've seen in the diamond holes that we've drilled to date, of which we've only drilled five, is that each of them has intersected the mineralisation as of where we expected it to, so no surprises. 
and two, that each of these alteration styles occurs in our ore and our mineralised zones. So that's really adding to the story is that we're really starting to see these alteration zones as and where we expect them. Hole four to the right there um, showed over 200 metres of this alteration and we're still waiting on the assay results for it. Um, one, two and three have shown good grades, good widths and uh, some, really good, uh, some really good grades in there. We recently reported on hole uh, five, which is a deeper diamond hole that we've just uh, completed. And in the, in the top there, it shows there's over 30 metres of this alteration. And really, wherever we see the red rocks um, is, is good. And anything alteration in and around the red rocks is what we're looking for. So well and truly seeing that here. And again, a lot of visible gold that we're seeing through this drill core. Um, and it's very significant because through the whole of the Karari deposits and all the previous drilling that we've seen here, there hasn't been any visible gold at all. So to actually then, I suppose it's the closing of that whole circle of the gap of the knowledge where we can actually start putting and linking gold and mineralisation to a depth, these alterations. So that's a story and that's a little build as we, as we drill more and more. We now know as in a, on a regional front and you see the Templar and Crusader in the bottom part of the picture there. Um, and we've done a lot more work, obviously, over time, and we've done gravity surveys, and again, the same as Karari to the south, you need to be in the gravity low, which we are, and we've covered that area, and now we're going to be building up the whole region. But we also know from the ground magnetics that we need to be in an area where we've got a gravity low, we need to be in a mag low within a mag high. And all of those circles represent that. They also occur a specific distance uh, apart, each one, which is often how these big clusters and these big mineralized systems occur. So this is the sort of the secret to the mineralization. We need a gravity low and mag corridors, and we need, need northeast structures. And I think you can see there that we've got a number of targets to, uh, to test moving forward into next year. So initially, uh, Solomon is, uh, is lined up to be the first one that will be tested in January. Um, we're increasing our uh, drillery capacity from uh, the two RC we've got at the moment to 4RC at the end of January and two diamond rigs. And we'll really start pushing the district now that we're getting a bit of a handle on where we, where we think the mineralisation is. So that's the Walbrook Gold Project. So we've got our strike length there of 50 Ks. It's the right rocks. And there's Northern Stars Corridor Ridge. So we're certainly hoping to emulate them and to, uh, to improve on, uh, on what they found today. The Bethanga Porphyry Copper is a Victorian copper project. Um, and I've got over 15 years experience hunting porphyry coppers through the Asia Pacific. And we've sort of brought that experience to, uh, to what we're doing here at Nexus. And been looking in, uh, for a number of copper projects over the years, but haven't found one that's really thought was meaningful until I uh, had the opportunity to uh, option this Bethanga project. Um, it's in Australia's premier porphyry copper district, hosts all of the main copper projects um, and copper uh, um, mines that we see in Australia. And so it's, in, it's got the right pedigree. And again, we come back to the right rocks. So I've been over there, uh, whacked the rocks. We're starting a uh, fertility study that's well and truly underway. We've completed soil sampling, rock chip sampling. We're doing the aeromagnet magnetic, magnetic assessment at the moment, and then we'll do some ground magnetics. And ultimately, we'll then decide whether we take the option up in March next year. But at the moment, all the, uh, the signals and the signs are looking like uh, it's a particularly interesting project and we'll be uh, we're taking up that option. We've had a lot of uh, interest and exposure, I suppose, in the recent times on uh, the results and the, uh, the success that we've been having. And so we sort of thought we'd start putting in a lot more detail of what the programs will look like. And so sort of as shareholders and investors, everyone can sort of follow the story a little bit better. So we're aiming to show significantly uh, increase and improve that, uh, that insight into where we're at. And as the project moves forward, we'll keep sort of showing where we're drilling when we're expecting the results. And um, as you can see there, it's something like a, uh, a fairly hectic Q1 next year. And um, we've spent the last couple of weeks since the financial uh, success and doing the money raising, uh, getting ourselves organised with field camps, drill rigs, and uh, gearing up to really hit the, uh, hit the ground running uh, heavily in 2022. So we've got the uh, Western Australian project, which is uh, going along really, really nicely. We're very happy, actively exploring it, 
great gold district and a lot of work to do in 2022. And we also added the uh, Bethanga Porphyry Copper Project through this last year, and it'll uh, get its uh, assessment as well. So very much like the uh, quality projects with the right rocks, we're well funded, and we're going to be very, very busy in uh, 2022. Thanks very much. And so we reach the high point of the conference, the final presentation. Stavely Minerals is currently completing phase one of a mineral resource drill out, as well as conducting the most comprehensive regional exploration program undertaken in the Stavely area, Victoria, in four decades. We welcome Executive Chairman Chris Cairns to tell us more. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to Stewie and the, the team here for uh, the 200th conference. It's been a, a we've been attendees and, and presenters at many of them, and it's always a, a good show, if you will. Um, I am standing between everybody else and beer, I suspect, so I'll try to be as quick as I can. I do have a bit to say, though. So, Staley uh, moved into Victoria in uh, 2013, so it wasn't really on the exploration radar at the time, so we uh, took advantage and, and got a large and fairly commanding tenure position west of Melbourne, about three hours, in Cambrian volcanic rocks that really had flown under the radar in terms of porphyry potential for some time. Um, we uh, explored aggressively for about six years until uh, we had some insights as to what the controls on mineralization were, and we made a discovery in September 2019. Since then, we've been drilling out the resource. Uh, as of yesterday, um, we've had access to the southern paddock, um, where we had uh, been denied access to date, and now we're on our way uh, up with up to four rigs to finish off the resource definition drilling for that part of the, the resource, and that will lead into uh, then a scoping study uh, mid next year. But it's a new style of mineralization never seen before in Australia. It's Butte, Montana, or uh, Magma, Arizona style, load style mineralization, copper, gold, silver, and structurally controlled and high grade. But given our position in the belt, um, and I've got some slides to show you, uh, an announcement out this morning with some drilling results from another porphyry that we've discovered, blind, undercover, uh, called Tora West. And it is most definitely a porphyry and um, early days there, but very, very good encouragement. And we've got lots of cash to see us through both the resource and the scoping study. And so we won't be coming to market until everybody's well informed as to what the project looks like. Share price has sort of recovered a little bit um, uh, for the moment. Um, it's in that boring period where you're completing a resource drill out, it's the valley of death, share price wise. But once we uh, uh, finish that resource drill out and the technical studies come out, people have a much better idea of what the project's worth. As well, we have the wild card, of course, of the very aggressive exploration program that we have over the next six months. So focusing in Western Victoria, as the picture illustrates, it's quite flat. Uh, it was very wet this winter, so it's very uh, challenging logistically to move drill rigs around in, in the wet. So we stopped drilling August, September, October, and, and just, just recently resumed. resumed. Uh, at, at Toro West, West. Um, but uh, it's it's easy to get around. Uh, there's a lot of cover though. There's not a lot of exposure, so you, you're really relying on geophysics to help you with your targeting and a limited amount of uh, surface geochemistry. So just focusing in on the Thursday's Gosson area, the porphyry is outlined in in the beige shaded area, but there is a, a what they call a calcite rich blanket which exists between 30 and 80 meters below surface. Um, that is a secondary copper enrichment due to weathering. Uh, it's got a large resource, 28 million tons, 0.4%, uh, 110,000 tons of copper. So that's quite a large resource, um, not including the high grade structurally controlled mineralization. Um, so it's, it's a very large uh, chunk of copper in the ground there. But we were looking for the porphyry underneath that, what was driving that whole system. And so over time, we drilled quite a few holes, uh, uh, 49 holes that culminated in a one point eight kilometer drill hole to the south there. Um, it was spectacularly barren. Um, and so one of our consultants said, well, 
in the course of these 49 holes, you've intercepted some narrow or high grade mineralization at depths of between 500 and 1,000 meters. Well, why don't you try and find that close to the surface? So hole 50 was designed and drilled. And as they say, the rest is history, 32 meters at 6% copper and gram gold from 62 meters drill depth and some quite spectacular sub intervals up to 40% copper. And really those photos show the, the tenor of the mineralization is driven by boronite and chalcosite, uh, high tenor copper minerals produces a very nice concentrate. Also, uh, no arsenic in this system, so it also will be a, a pure concentrate. So the, the host is on a structure between an ultramafic and uh, the volcano sedimentary sequence. So the ultramafic is very strongly magnetic and it's that contact that we've drilled out so far with about 120 holes. And we've got a small bit yet to do down in the south. It's illustrated here in that little red triangle. Uh, that's where, as of yesterday, we had access to so the drill rig is moving in there now. We expect to drill three holes before Christmas and then have a two week break and come back on the 3rd of January and complete the remaining 17 holes uh, of a 20 hole program by the end of February. So the, the system as we know it to date, and we've just been focusing on the, the top 200 meters of the, of the resource drilling. At the northwestern end there, we've got a, a base metal, precious metal intercept with uh, high grade zinc and gold. And then down to the south, we drilled underneath the fence line of the paddock that we now have access to and hit 23 meters at over 1% copper at about 350 meter steps. So we have a certain amount of confidence that we're going to extend this ore body to the southeast as we get into that paddock. So one and a half kilometers strike extent, uh, and it's not closed off. To the north, we expect it to continue into more of a, a, a zinc gold type of system, uh, whereas down to the south, it looks like it's getting hotter and we might be getting into more of a boronite zone. So this is what it looks like in, in cross section. Um, the, the bubbles are uh, uh, sort of copper percent by meters intercepts. Um, and uh, the big pink per, uh, circles are going to be somewhere in the order of the equivalent of 50 meter intercepts greater than 2% copper equivalent. So they're really meaningful intercepts. And the, the apparent plunge to the south, and you can see that we've got that little square where we're setting up the drills just now, um, is likely not as shallow as that. There may be a, an offset on that structure to the south. So this, the true plunge may be just a little bit steeper than it's shown there. But um, we've got intercepts on this system at drill depths of in excess of 1,150 meters. So these are very, very tall systems. Um, so we've got a lot of drilling yet to do to find out where the extent of the system is. Just running through what are some of the, the normal sort of intercepts we get. Uh, this one was quite nice, uh, 87 meters at one three quarter percent copper, half a gram gold. And typically uh, these intercepts, we have a, a basal intercept that is higher grade. In this case, it's that nine meters at 4.1% copper and almost two grams gold. Typically, we also do get another intercept within the, the broader zone. It can be immediately on the hanging wall or it can migrate into the, into the overall intercept. Um, in this case, 24 meters at 4.2% copper and one and a quarter grams gold. And the point on this is that that 87 meters will be taken in an open pit, whereas underground, you focus on those higher grade zones. This is amenable to both open pit and underground as we go deeper. Just one other real intercept. This one uh, illustrates the combination of the chalcosite blanket at the top of this drill hole. Intercept overall is 144 meters at over a percent copper. Um, bit of gold, bit of silver. Up the top, it's mainly just copper. There's not a lot of gold or silver, but then the main intercept of uh, uh, primary mineralization in this case is 84 meters at one and a half percent copper, 0.23 grams gold, which is very vanilla for us. Again, that basal intercept is a little bit sweeter at 28 meters at 3.3 percent copper and 0.49 gold. So that's very vanilla for us. Um, this one I've, I've just included to illustrate that um, there is uh, a late gold overprint. So the overall interval here is 48 meters, 1.4% copper, and uh, unusually six grams gold. 
but that's really driven by an exceptionally high grade in this of two meters of very modest copper at 0.7%, but 132 grams gold, and that's that late gold overprint. So we've hit it over a, a vertical extent in excess of a kilometer. Um, we have just been focusing on the very shallow zero to 200 meters for the resource drill out, but there's a long way to go to drill this out. We can take that main mineralization down to depth. Um, we've had intercepts uh, in what we call the copper loads play. play. We'll bring them up to the surface, and then some, some of the more recent drilling has, has intercepted that quite close, close to the surface, and so we'll probably fall into an open pit. pit. It's not, not as big as the Kaylee load. load. Um, we'll, we'll extend it down, and there's, there's been, been a couple of hits on what we call the north south structures. So we know of three mineralized structures, and we've really focused on only 20% of one of those. We got, got the regional, regional targets, targets which, which I've got, got a bit to say about today, and there's a porphyry driving the system this depth. depth. We haven't we haven't found it yet, yet. and, and uh, it's, it's still, still down, down there. But um, at, at the, the moment, moment we've got, got lower, lower hanging, hanging fruit. fruit. We've got a porphyry at Toro West, West, West starts at 30 meters depth, depth. depth, and that's what and we're that's drilling, what we're drilling right, now. right now. So in terms, so in terms of development, of development, very thumbnail sketch, thumbnail sketch, does it open pit, decline off that open pit, and then accessing multiple mineralized horizons off that. Underground, uh, infrastructure. underground infrastructure. So all we're doing so all in the, we're the scoping, scoping, scoping study, study is describing what the open pit looks like. like. The rest of the underground is for free. So that's, that's the plan, plan. Pretty, pretty much as I've described it to you. We've got a lot of drilling to do, um, and uh, you know we're pretty well advanced in, in the scoping study, and we'll just finish off that resource and everything will fit together uh, and have that out by mid-year. I do really want to speak about the regional exploration. It's got us quite excited. Um, I've been speaking to the site uh, every morning for a couple of days now. Um, just have to go through a bit of boring explanatory work. Um, the evolution of this area was two parallel arcs. It got bent around what we call the Mave King, Mega Kink. Uh, the two arc segments snapped off, and then the rest of the arc continued up to the north. And that's exactly what we're showing here. Arc here, arc here, this is a stably arc. Thursday's Boston sits in here. These two segments have sl rotated, snapped off, and then continues up here into battery minerals uh, tenure up in that area. So worth noting that all of the known uh, prospects are in this 20 kilometer or so window uh, where there is subcrop, but to the south it's buried under basalt and to the north under tertiary uh, transported cover. And so otherwise we're working blind. And so that's where the excitement really lies. Um, again, uh, all those known prospects in a window of exposure or, or you know, poorly exposed. Um, but the other 95 kilometers of belt that we have is, is under cover. So during winter when we weren't drilling, the team on site did a major uh, regional exploration targeting program. Um, we made a discovery at Toro West. It wasn't previously known as a prospect until we drilled it. Uh, it's, it's under 30, 30 meters, meters of younger cover, no exposure at all, uh, and diamond drilling is in progress at the moment, just in this area. So we, the preparation was we did an air core program to get through the cover and get some geocam of the bedrock. It came back with a strong copper moly uh, signature with a couple of other elements, um, just tagged the bedrock, and now we're drilling it with a couple of drill holes. Drill hole six, I don't think I've got a, a plan for, it's in the announcement this morning, but it's sitting colors up in here. Hole five is about 1.2 kilometers down in here. Um, and we've got a third plan just in this area here, but I've got some photos of hole six. So a couple of neat photos, and again, people's eyes glaze over with photos of rocks. The explanatory is, this is what they call a brain rock. It, you get this at, at the top of a porphyry intrusion. It's got uh, pyrite and chalcopyrite in its fertile system. Molly in a quartz vein at shallow depths. This is all sulfide, pyrite, chalcopyrite, and chalcosite. So it's a, a nice little system. You like to see hypogene chalcosite because it's high grade. This is more distal sort of veining because we don't have very strong alteration but this is from this morning's drill report with this red rock alteration and, and similar to Nexus, where it gets red, it's good. Um, so uh, it's similar sort of fluid dynamics are going on in these porphyry systems as is going on in Nexus. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. It looks like it's the right rocks and it may well be that this is a, a, a 
uh, monza diorite porphyry, which is the same type of rocks that you have at Cadia and at North Parks. So we're very excited. We think that with the more distal stuff, we're sitting probably here in the argillic to propolitic sort of area, but with this red rock alteration, we think that we're getting just that little bit closer to the potassic core, a little bit hotter, a little bit more intense, and hence the excitement. Regional exploration, so this is just air core really uh, is the main tool at the moment. Uh, these are two blind targets uh, under basalts. Um, the previous exploration couldn't get through the basalt, so we've managed to. Um, all of these holes have uh, come through and hit clay alteration with disseminated pyrite, and one of the prospects had a bit of chalcopyrite. Four out of five targets we've tested so far have turned out to be clay alteration associated with, with uh, sulfides. Um, so we've had an 80% uh, success rate so far. So that's pretty outstanding exploring undercover. So the, we're hoping for geochem from these uh, over the coming weeks, uh, possibly just before Christmas or maybe just after. So there is a massive opportunity for discovery. We're on Tour West. We've got 19 uh, regional targets to test. We've tested five of those. Um, and so it's early days, but we're having really good success rates so, so far. Our program really, uh, that Toro West drilling is in progress because we like what we see. We've extended a few holes, so we're now into December. Uh, the regional exploration has been going on. It will stop now while we then focus on the resource drill out. And uh, then we'll get those assays. The mineral resource estimate fo follows in April, the um, scoping study in May. And during that time, the geologists swing back into the regional exploration. So just to finish it up, um, you know, copper clearly is, and many people have said, including Diddy at the, at the beginning of the conference, you know, copper is a, a place to be, can't possibly see how there's sufficient supply to, to satisfy demand. And there are very few quality copper assets coming online in first world jurisdictions. So we are a first mover. Um, an, a unique deposit at, at the Cayley load, but incredible opportunity for additional discoveries in the in the dominant tenure position that we've, we've acquired and a lot of targets to be tested in the next six months, the resource drill out, the scoping study, regional exploration and Toro West drilling. Um, so it's going to be very, very busy newsworthy wise and uh, yeah, it's going to be very exciting. So thank you very much for your attention and your attendance at the conference. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, and that uh, brings proceedings to a close. Thank you for your attendance. We hope you got some good investment uh, tips, and we advise you to uh, be careful on the roads, travel safely, and invest wisely.